This 10 minutes in history will cover the history of the visual cliff, an important experiment in psychology that's results continue to impact the field today. The visual cliff has become a classic experiment discussed in many introduction to psychology courses. But do we really know what went on during the time that this study was being developed? Is what is remembered today in popular culture an accurate depiction of the intent of the experiment? Let's take a look at how the visual cliff is discussed today and then take a look back at its beginnings. A review of publications, websites, and research articles often points to a seemingly simple description with a fascinating origin of the visual cliff. Photos showing babies placed on a tabletop peering hesitantly over a plexiglass surface is usually what you will find in a search of the visual cliff. A cursory glance of the experiment gives us the idea that children are being studied for their reaction to unknown, fearful, or uncomfortable situations. That a relationship between children's locomotor ability and depth perception is being studied. Or that an answer to the question of what knowledge is innate and what is learned can be found. A slightly deeper investigation into the visual clip experiment may lead to a story of a woman who was inspired to conduct a study after watching her children walk toward the edge of the Grand Canyon. Is this really what the experiment was all about? And is this really how it came to be? In order to talk about the visual cliff and find out the truth behind this classic experiment, we must first get to know Eleanor Gibson. Dr. Eleanor Jack Gibson was born in Peoria, Illinois in 1910. Her father was a businessman and her mother a housewife. After graduating from high school, she had a desire to leave the Midwest and continue her education. She moved to Massachusetts and received both her undergraduate and master's degrees from Smith College. While there, she became interested in comparative psychology and learning. The animal lab at Smith was quite small, which did not afford Gibson much of an opportunity to pursue her passion. And since Smith did not offer any further graduate degrees, Gibson enrolled at Yale University in 1935. There, she felt she would have a chance to work alongside many well-respected psychologists who could mentor her in the areas she was most interested in. Robert Yerkes was conducting work in comparative psychology in his study of chimpanzees, and Clark Hall was developing his theory of learning. In her first meeting with Dr. Yerkes to discuss her interest in helping out in his lab, she recounts that he got up, held open his office door, and stated, I have no women in my laboratory, and that's that. Thankfully, she found more acceptability with Dr. Hall. Hall was a behaviorist and based his studies on conditional reflexes, which was in contrast with Gibson's own views of learning. Nevertheless, she found that she could incorporate some of Hall's theories into her dissertation research by applying generalization and differential inhibition to human learning. In 1938, she received her PhD from Yale. After graduation, Eleanor Gibson spent a few years teaching at Smith College, where she was able to continue her interest in comparative psychology. She also spent time moving around the country with her husband and children, and then in 1949 ended up at Cornell after her husband received a faculty position there. Though Eleanor was also interested in taking a faculty position at Cornell, she was not offered one due to the nepotism rules in place at the time. Fortunately, Dr. Howard Liddell offered Eleanor a position as a research associate at his behavior farm. As part of her work, Gibson worked with sheep and goats in experiments on neurosis and other animal behaviors. Although not part of Liddell's planned experiments, Gibson became interested in what she observed between the mothers and their babies so much so that she decided to conduct her own experiments investigating rearing behaviors. Pleased with her work and excited about how she was spending her time, Gibson presented on her findings and has even commented that she sees some of these publications as her best work. It was during one of the days at Liddell's farm while she was collecting data for her rearing experiments that she noticed the behavior of a baby goat 
who had been placed on a high shelf to be temporarily kept out of the way. To her amazement, the kid stood in place and did not attempt to walk or jump off the ledge. Though this interesting phenomena was only a note that was placed in the back of Gibson's mind, her eagerness to continue with her experiments into animal rearing behaviors increased and things went well. Until she arrived at the farm one day to find that Liddell had given away all of the goats from her control group to parents who were looking for an Easter gift for their children. Furious, she left the farm and her research. Looking for another opportunity to continue her research interests in rearing behaviors, in 1956, Gibson approached a young Dr. Richard Walk, who worked in the psychology department's rat lab. Through a grant, Gibson and Walk spent many hours researching the effects of light on animal discriminatory behavior. Growing tired of the lack of variation in the work, Gibson suggested they add another component that investigated visual perception similar to what she'd observed from the goat at Liddell's farm. Working with their research assistants, Gibson and Walt devised a type of tabletop using a piece of glass, a red and white tablecloth, clamps, and a board. Placing the rats on the center board, Gibson and Walt compared the behaviors of the dark reared rats to those of the light reared rats. They noticed that both sets of rats left the board and walked toward the side with the shallow surface rather than the side with the drop off. Calling their device and experiment the visual cliff, Gibson and Walt wrote another grant proposal and continued their experiments with other animals such as kittens, puppies, and chicks. They concluded that in most species, visual maturation is not dependent on light and that depth discrimination seems to be innate and connected with other motor development. Stating in a 1960 publication, we are ready to venture the rather broad conclusion that a seeing animal will be able to discriminate depth when its locomotion is adequate, even when locomotion begins at birth. As the experiments continued and the apparatus was refined, Gibson and Walk decided it was time to observe the behaviors of human infants. They put an ad in the local newspaper asking, have you a crawling baby? If so, your baby can earn $3 in an experiment. Working with 36 infants ranging in age from six to 14 months, Gibson and Walk placed the children on the center board and positioned the mother at the edge of the table on the shallow side, and then the cliff side in turn. They reported that the babies generally crawled to their mothers on the shallow side, but only a few crawled to her over the deep side, and some cried or crawled on the shallow side when faced with this situation. The experiment showed that most human infants are able to discriminate depth by the time they learn to crawl. They appeared to depend upon their visual ability. It also showed as some infants would reach out and touch the glass above the cliff or back onto the glass in an effort to crawl forward on the shallow end, that the infant's locomotor development had not always been at the same pace as their visual perception development. In 1959, Walt left Cornell to take a position at George Washington University. He and Gibson decided that Walk would take the experimental instruments and continued the research. In some of his later work using the visual cliff, Walk experimented with new animals like crabs, ducks, and snakes. He also continued the research with human subjects. One particular behavior that he focused on while at George Washington University was the visual placing response. He investigated whether infants initially reached out their hand in approaching either or both the shallow and deep side of the visual cliff and found that almost all of the subjects use visual placing before crawling to the shallow side, but did not use it in an attempt to crawl across the deep side, leading him to posit that the visual placing response is a visual one rather than a reflexive response. Later in the 1970s, 
Walt licensed the visual cliff to Lafayette Instrument Company. With so much time and effort put into the visual cliff experiments in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, is it still a relevant topic? Psychologists at New York University, University of California, Berkeley, and Tulane University have continued using the visual cliff experiment in their research labs. A hands-on experiment is even available to parents and their infants at the Ontario Science Center. Moreover, a search of publications reveals the visual cliff is mentioned in over 600 academic journals, reports, or magazine articles, and over 100 since the year 2010. So it seems that the work of Gibson and Walk is still considered an important topic today. Although the origins and beginnings of the visual cliff may not always be remembered correctly, no, the idea did not come from children walking too closely to the edge of the Grand Canyon, and the experiment did not even begin with human subjects. It seems that using the visual cliff as a means to better understand our visual perception development is a topic that continues to be popular in the field of psychology.